You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London, and I'm Daniel Sinner with today's discussion. The European Parliament has voted to limit the use of biofuels. MEPs say that by 2020, no more than 6% of all transport fuel in the EU should come from biofuels. They're made from organic sources such as plants and animal byproducts. Although they're considered to be more sustainable than fossil fuels like oil and gas, the European Parliament says it's concerned that the production of biofuels is pushing up food prices and damaging the environment. Advocates say that biofuels are a clean, renewable source of energy and can be significantly cheaper than other fossil fuels. On today's panel are Roger Helmer, a UKIP MEP and the party's spokesman on industry and energy. James Hartfield is the director of the think tank Audacity. Vivian Moses is visiting professor of biotechnology at King's College London. Rachel Noble is a researcher at the campaign group ActionAid. And on the phone from Brussels is Rob Veerhout from EPure, which represents Europe's renewable ethanol industry. Let's begin with Roger Helmer, UKIP MEP. A clean renewable energy, it's great news, surely. No worries about fossil fuels. The point is this, that first of all, we started out with biofuels and we said they will save emissions. Then we realised there was quite a big energy input in agriculture and in creating biofuels, so we weren't saving so much emissions as we thought we were. Now we've realised, and this is the thrust of the Parliament decision and the Commission policy, they have added what is called indirect land use change, or ILUC. What we're saying is if you take 100 hectares and grow biofuels, um, then surely enough, some other land somewhere is going to be put under cultivation, perhaps where it's quite damaging, like by taking down rainforest or whatever, And therefore, here is another factor that you have to discount against the savings you originally made. In other words, as a device for reducing emissions, if that's what you want to do, they are much less good than we thought. James Hartfield from Audacity. I wonder if biofuels are being made a scapegoat. It's worth bearing in mind that between 1993 and 2008, Europe's agriculture policy was designed to retire land from production. And that's much more likely the reason why food prices were rising than the biofuels business. Biofuels might be a solution, they might not be a solution. I think the big problem is that once again we have the European Union trying to unpick a problem that it created in the past. It's not very good as a decision-making institution. It's not really talking to enough people. It's not part of a conversation. And it does tend to blunder from one policy. And and now we find that the biofuels policy that they supported has become a problem, they tell us, and now they want to undo it. And it's hard to know what the truth is underneath these zigzags. Rachel Noble from ActionAid, is biofuels being made a scapegoat? We don't see it that way at all. Our concerns with biofuels relate to the way they impact upon global food prices. If you take significant quantities of food out of global production and channel those into the production of biofuels, it's going to have an upward increase on food prices. And this is happening at a time when you still have 870 million people in the world without enough food to eat. Um, It's not only contributing to food price rises, but also to food price volatility. And the EU biofuels policies are incentivising investors to go out and acquire land in Africa, um, often without um, adequate consultation with local communities, amounting to land grabbing, essentially. And this is, again, having negative impacts upon the communities living in those countries in terms of their their access to, to food and livelihoods. Uh, Vivian Moses from King's College London. It depends on why you think you want to use them, what you think they will do, whether they will actually do so, what the costs are both of doing so and the costs that you may save or incur in other directions. And so I think it's a, it's a case of defining all these parameters, and it may not be easy to do that, I have to admit, uh, defining the parameters and deciding case by case what you're trying to do and whether this particular way of doing it is a solution to solve a particular problem. But to generalise and say, are they a good idea or a bad idea? I can't answer a question like that. Rob Veja, what are your thoughts from EPIO? Well, clearly, um, when in 2009, uh, Parliament and Council and uh, and Commission were unanimous in uh, promoting biofuels, we welcomed that decision. There was ample uh, discussion on it at every possible level. We invested, we invested the ethanol industry 8 billion euros because we were requested to produce biofuels. We did that. We created lots of jobs. We created 70,000 jobs. And 
all of a sudden we are seen as a big problem, uh, whereas still, and I dare do disagree with Mr. Helmer, we do save emissions compared to fossil fuel. Uh, maybe it is less than originally foreseen, but I can guarantee that on average, European produced ethanol made in Europe, produced with European feedstock on European land, is saving on average more than 50% uh, greenhouse gas saving compared to fossil fuel. So I think we are doing a good job and we should continue with doing that. And you take that into account, including you know the fuel used for tractors and plows, you still think... Yeah, there is yes, a... absolutely. This has all been accounted for. It's all in a methodology that's written into the legislation, and we cannot simply fool around. We need to demonstrate that we are creating those savings, are achieving those savings, and, and, and we deliver that. There are certificates that demonstrate that these savings are realised. Yeah, Roger, how many estimates that uh, Rob Verha is making on indirect land use change? Um, but uh, I do agree with him that the European Union is chopping and changing and creating regulatory uncertainty. I've talked to other companies that have invested tens or hundreds of millions of euros, big, big money in big, big plants, on the basis of our commitment as the European Union that we go for 10% by 2020. We've now come along and said, well, thank you for that investment, but actually we don't want it because we're only going to go for 6%. That is very, very damaging to industry. Rachel Noble from ActionAid, what are your thoughts about you know, the carbon emissions from creating these biofuels? It's, it's clear that the, the life cycle emissions of biofuels, particularly biodiesel, when, when they're calculated over the whole lifespan of, of in, taking into account the clearance of, of rainforests, peatlands, etc., they do actually have very often a worse net climate impact in terms of carbon emissions. It's also important to think about the vast quantities of feedstock, even for bioethanol, that the European Union is importing. Um, there isn't enough land, uh, it's widely thought, in Europe to produce sufficient quantities of bio oh, um, but the 400 billion euros worth of bioethanol feedstock was imported to, uh, into the eu in one year alone let's bring rob veer out here no but that's that's you don't know the numbers we produce in europe 4.6 billion litres of ethanol. It's all produced with European feedstock. We set aside, these are FAO data, every year, half a million hectare, hectares of arable land. So there is enough land in Europe. We don't need to import any biofuel from outside of Europe as far as ethanol is concerned. We have an installed production capacity that can easily supply the market. Well, it's, 4 it's, billion euros worth of bioethanol feedstock was imported to the EU in 2010-11, I believe. And we, we know that 6 million hectares of land in sub-Saharan Africa have been acquired by European bio fuel uh, companies explicitly stating in most cases that that land, um, that production is going to be used uh, to provide fuel to the European market. What, what are your concerns with, with taking that land and using that land? Our concern is the way that it's, it's impacting upon local communities in those countries. So, for example, last week we launched um, a new report looking at a case of a company called um, Adax Bioenergy, which is a Swiss company, and they've acquired land. They have a plantation in Sierra Leone, and our research, which entailed talking to over 100 people spread across 10 communities in the local area. Um, our research shows how hunger has actually increased, um, they believe, since since ADAX uh, arrived. And the, the jobs um, that are being offered are, are often very poorly paid. Compensation hasn't adu adequately been paid. And it's, it's about the sheer lack of adequate uh, consultation with the communities um, in terms of how the land was, was acquired. Yeah. Obviously, and, ADAX aren't here to defend themselves, yeah. and it's all part of the report, which, which obviously gives one side of it. But Roger I, I Helmer. Think, I think um, Rachel should remember there are two sides to this question. I don't know the African situation, but mm. I do know the Malaysian and Indonesian position on palm oil mm. pretty well, and it is absolutely clear that the use of palm oil from Malaysia uh, in the biofuel fuels business has been positive for the economy of Malaysia. It has created jobs and livelihoods. So, in a way, you, you're, you're conflicted because in some cases you're saying maybe damaging, in other cases you're saying it's creating jobs. But even palm oil is one of the least efficient types of biofuels anyway. Uh, it is arguably one of the less efficient types of, uh, of, of biofuels. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Daniel Sinner. On today's panel are Roger Helmer, a UKIP MEP and the party's spokesman on industry and energy. James Hartfield is the director of the think tank Audacity. 
Vivian Moses is visiting professor of biotechnology at King's College London. Rachel Noble is a researcher at the campaign group ActionAid. And on the phone from Brussels is Rob Veerhout from ePure, which represents Europe's renewable ethanol industry. Let's go to Vivian Moses. I'd like to pick up on something that our friend in Brussels said. He said that there was a, they allotted €8 billion, Euros, was it, to promote this activity. I, I haven't seen any analysis of the outcome of that. What else might that €8 billion Euros have been used for and would it have been any better? So I'd like to know exactly what the, the objective was. What uh, the I mean, what the European Union does is it picks winners. It decides that biofuels are going to be the winner. Then, of course, as we've seen, it comes back and says, well, maybe they're not so good as we thought. Didn't we but it, to do that in this country? We did, yes. and it was, we decided it was a very bad thing. Okay. If they had taken that money and used it, for example, on research and development on solar, we and my party are very unhappy with wind and solar at the current stage of development, but I'm perfectly happy to concede, probably not wind, but I think that maybe in 10, 15, <coughs> 20 years' time, solar may be a worthwhile way of generating electricity. Unfortunately, we've invested in highly inefficient renewables when we should have been investing much less money, much more effectively, in technological development to give us economically viable renewables. James Hartfield, okay, I, I was going to go to James Hartfield first, Rob, and I'll, I'll come straight to you afterwards. James, what are, you, what are your thoughts about these subsidies? There's, there's concerns that they're driving some farmers just to clear their land to meet the demand of European drivers. I don't think it's morally wrong to back winners or, or to, to reform Bad or business, direct, though. but it can be very ineffective. And I think this is a case mm. where you can see that, um, that it's, it's like trying to steer a big ocean liner. For a long time, the goal was to get farmers out of farming, was to pay them not to farm. And this led to set-aside schemes and wilderness schemes, which is why I don't think there is actually a shortage of land, not in Europe, nor actually worldwide. You know, if, if the, the size of the world national parks dwarfs the uh, amount of land committed to biofuels, but it's infinitesimal. You can farm in national parks, but it's, it's uh, dissuaded. So I think we've had this policy for a long time to retire land from production in Europe, and that did create the rise in food prices. That's why food prices were, did spike, especially in 2008, because it was an actual shortage, was created just as years previously the European Union created excesses by subsidising. They created a shortage. And biofuels is not really the problem. It might be in, in, in a, a trigger, you know, it might be an extra pressure that um, we might need to attend. But it's just a clue that um, this is not a very good way to proceed, to keep steering the tanker this way and then be surprised when you're going east and suddenly you think you've got to steer it the other way. Sure, let's go back to Rob Veerhout. You wanted to come in just yes. before. Uh, thank you. Well, first of all, there is a slight misunderstanding here. If I mention the number 8 billion euro, it was money invested by the industry in creating production capacity. I wasn't talking about any government money going into, into our industry. Uh, there are quite some misperceptions mis, uh, on that as well. Now, I would like to come back to, to Rachel on, on the land grab. Let me put up front that we, as a European industry, we do not agree to any kind of land grab. We, should, we believe that should not happen. We believe that it should be written into the legislation that if there is any form of land grab, those biofuels should not be sent to Europe, should not be received by Europe. But to be clear on this one, we do not import a single drop of ethanol from Africa. And, and, and I cannot speak on behalf of, on behalf of, on behalf of ADEX because ADEX is not a, a member of company of EPURE, but we regret every form of land grab and we believe it's, it is not taking place because of European biofuel policy. And recently the ODI has produced a report that made clear that the numbers were hugely exaggerated. Now, on the food prices recently, there was a report of the World Bank that clearly said that the main driver for food price increases is oil. It's oil. It's not biofuels. Uh, we use about 1% of European land. We, we use about 2% net of, of uh, cereals in Europe. We produce animal feed. We produce as much ethanol as we produce animal feed. More animal, animal feed means less imports of soy from South America and from North America. If we need to import more soy, it means more land use in those areas. Ra so Rachel, let's get to Rachel. Do you think the EU is to blame for these land grabs? 
Yeah, well, I'd like to come back on a, on a few of those points. Firstly, ADAX was an interesting case for us to look at because as of next year, they will start exporting biofuels to the European Union. That's one of the reasons why we looked at them. At present, the EU may not be importing significant quantities, but that's not to say that's not the case. The 6 million hectares figure I cited earlier relates to 98 European com- companies that have invested in Africa many of whom with the explicit purpose for importing to Europe. To the Overseas Development Institute research, five countries in total that it looks at, four of which are in sub-Saharan Africa, and it doesn't in its figures include land that's been planned or authorised for biofuel production. It only cites figures for land that's actually currently being cultivated. So for those reasons, that does need to be borne in mind when considering that data. And last, in terms of food price rises, the Joint Research Centre of the European Commission just last week released a new report showing that with the removal of the biofuels mandate within Europe, seed prices, food prices could decline within the EU, for example, by as much as as 50%. If you look at the cereal prices, there is a difference of 1%. Read the report. Read the report. It's one percent. The JRC research it, it, it was put it at, at five, I believe, five to seven percent. Well, let's bring in James Hartfield. You say biofuels is being made a scapegoat. Is it also being made a scapegoat for rises in food prices? And if so, who's to blame for these rises in food prices? I, I do think that it could be one of the factors that puts pressure in it in an a, a, a absolutely immediate way. It's it's clear that if you had a policy in place uh, to retire land from production because uh, so the idea was let's stop them producing but again it was from the top down in this rather stalinist way that Hmm. the european union operates and not very sensitive to the changes that are taking place and they didn't notice that institutional policy-led land retirement policy would create uh, a shortage which is what happened i mean it created a shortage relative to increasing demand it was because people are generally better off in, and world food prices spiked because there's more incomes, uh, especially in the Far East. And all those things come kind of crashed together to create a big spike in, in food prices. And that was, a, that was a real problem. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Daniel Sinner. On today's panel are Roger Helmer, a UKIP MEP and the party's spokesman on industry and energy. James Hartfield is the director of the think tank Audacity. Vivian Moses is visiting professor of biotechnology at King's College London. Rachel Noble is a researcher at the campaign group ActionAid. And on the phone from Brussels is Rob Veerhout from ePure, which represents Europe's renewable ethanol industry. Can I can I support both James and, and Rachel here? Because... Uh, a lot of economic models will show that in volatile markets, relatively small changes in supply can have very significant knock-on effects uh, on food prices. Um, And I have to believe that taking uh, even small percentages of land out of production for food and putting them for something else can significantly affect food availability, global hunger, um, and very much food prices. And that is something... Uh, that in my view we ought to bear in mind. I think uh, I have a sort of moral problem with taking good food in a hungry world and burning it. I think that is a bad thing to do. James Hartfield, is, is that... I, yeah, sure, you? Rob, I, in fact, you can answer this question. Um, Rob, do you think it's irresponsible then, uh, as Roger no, was saying, no, to it, burn good food? We, we are not burning good food. What we are using, uh, just to give you an example, we are using the sugars in the food. The sugars are not bad, not good for humans. And... What we do is the proteins, the sugars we, we turn into ethanol, and the proteins that are in the cereals and in the sugar beet, we, we give on to the, to the feed and the food sector. Um, the cereals we're using is not, is not for food, it's not for making bread, it's for, it's for animals. It's a totally different type of cereal. To give you a clear example on, on numbers, in the last three years, global biofuel production has been stable. It has not increased. In the case of ethanol, it was 100 billion liters of of, of, of ethanol produced, and we produce four, around four, five, four point six uh, li- billion liters of that total volume. What we see this year is that we will have the highest, the highest crop um, ever in, in, in human history. So, where is the relationship between biofuel production and food price increases? Uh, Rachel, Rachel Noble, where, where is the, where is the, it's, it's simply not there. Where is the correlation? 
There have been various pieces of research um, done, uh, various different modelling techniques used um, to to show how biofuels, you know, this diversion of significant quantities of wheat, maize, for example, into diverting that into the fuel market impacts upon food prices. So, it, you know, there, there's a question, the question's more around how much they impact, but even incremental, very small in, increases have a huge impact for people living in poverty in developing countries who spend up to 80% of their income on food. And, and you know, that's our concern that, that, you know, food should be used to feed people, not, not to fuel cars. And it's also important to bear in mind that by, by 2030, it's estimated that we're going to need 50% more food to feed a growing global population. Let's bring in Vivian Moses, because just, just we haven't heard from him for a while. Um, you've done a lot of work on, on GM food and the role that it might be able to help it with biofuels. What role can it play? Well, it can, in, in as much as GM may offer more efficiencies than existing procedures, then it will have an advantage in any agricultural activity that you wish to undertake. But you're not going to get a several fold increase in activity. You, you may get very significant ones which are very important, but not enormous. That's to say, you're not going to double or treble or quadruple the amount of product you get. So I think those considerations are have to be taken into account. I think GM is a valuable technology for all sorts of reasons, but I don't think it's a major player in this particular one. So all, all in all, you have to consider, first of all, that we're talking about taking land away from food. You must remember, of course, that much land is not grown for the production, not used for the production of food, but for the production of other agricultural products, fibres of all sorts and timber and all sorts of things. So you have to take the big picture and not just concentrate on the food issue. And as we have heard, the food the, the food demands grow and change and are very sensitive to a whole series of outside influences, of which this is certainly one. So if there is competition for the use of land and agricultural procedures for biofuels, then inevitably there will be a knock-on effect on other ag agricultural products. And it's a question of deciding then which you like, which what how big the knock-on effect is, and what do you think the balance of affairs ought to be with regard to the various products that you make. Now, as I understand it in, in this world of ours, we have a market to decide things like that. In fact, the market is there and the market, many people think, works well to apportion resources according to demand and, and opportunity. And then we have, on top of that, we have the intervention of governments and super government uh, organisations. And you then have to decide what sort of system you want out of all this. And I see that you are about to... Yeah, yeah, professor, professor, yeah, professor, professor you are making a, one of the most important points we've made this morning that markets allocate resources efficiently, bureaucrats sitting in Brussels and saying, we'll have 10% biofuels by 2020, or no, we made a mistake, we'll have 6% biofuels by 2020. They cut across markets and they do serious economic damage. But the point I wanted to pick up was one of Rob Verhut's points from earlier on. He just happened to refer to the fact they have a record harvest. And I would just like to remind everybody that one of the benefits of rising atmospheric CO2, and we rarely talk about the benefits of rising atmospheric CO2, is that it makes plants grow faster. So when Rachel is quite worried, quite, quite rightly worried about the future of the human race and the demand for more food by 2030 or 2050 or whatever, yes, that is a serious problem. Higher levels of atmospheric CO2 will in fact help us to deliver. It improves biomass formation, it improves crop yields. James Hartfield, you wanted to jump in. Well, I, I do think that um, uh, we need some sense of proportion in which are the, the factors that are leading to food price rises because the major factor is to do with uh, rising incomes. It's a success story and we should bear in mind that it's to do with East Asia's um, increasing incomes and people moving from largely vegetarian to uh, meat-based diets. Um, and that's something that it's very hard to say you can't do because um, it's just a factor of people improving their living standards. It's also a very happy story, we should say, because the, the story of, of crop yields is one of, of, of considerable success. Over the years, we've seen yields increase and increase per hectare, and that's what's made it possible to um, feed the world. And, and all of the prognostications of starvation that we were confronted with in the past did turn out to be uh, a massive scare stories.
But although um, things are getting better, there are still well, a large number of people still going hungry, and biofuels are, are consistent problem. It is a there consistent are problem, many. and it's not to be dismissed. However, the solution is more development, not less. Uh, we should be thrilled, really, by the the way that the biofuel business is pushing agriculture forward. I think Vivian's right to point out that you know it, agriculture isn't all about food you know that's a somewhat moralistic idea you know it's also about um wood and paper uh you know in finland it's not really about food primarily it's um it's about those things that they export and we i think rob has made a very good case that there is no huge dent in um food production coming from the biofuels industry it's a scapegoat rachel noble uh We've never, we've never said that biofuels is the only contributor to food price rises. It, it is a one of many, and we feel it's significant, given that, as I said before, the poorest people in the world, many of whom are farmers in Africa who are net purchasers of food themselves, spend up to 80% of their income on food. And, you know, we're, we're absolutely for agricultural investment in, in Africa, but that needs to be based on developed in a way that respects the rights of the people, the communities, the farming communities living in those countries and in a way that primarily seeks to address the food insecurity that exists at a local level um, and within developing countries as a, as, a, as a priority. And a lot of the biofuels plantations, they tend to be very large scale, um, mono agricultural models of production that, that see local communities pushed off land that they may have previously used to grow food. Um, and as the ADAX case study in Sierra Leone has shown, food security locally has increased as a result of this biofuels plantation because local people no longer have that land to grow food on. But the but fundamental point... farming is a yeah. real disaster mm. for people. It's locked people into poverty mm. for generations. Mm. And um, it, it can't be the answer that people yeah. grow. I think, I think the, f the fundamental point here, though, that we would make from my point of view is that biofuels are fundamentally a misallocation of resources because they're predicated on the basis that, one, they reduce emissions and they may do a bit, but nothing like as much as people imagine, and two, that it is necessary to reduce emissions. Uh, and I think it is becoming increasingly doubtful that actually it is uh, an important thing to do. The world is awash with natural gas. We've got fossil fuels for at least 200 years. Uh, and it seems pointless to uh, to pursue these cul-de-sacs. First of all, I, I do disagree with you. I mean, we need to prove that we are saving emissions. We need to supply certificates to governments that show that we are saving those emissions. Now, coming back to Rachel's remark, again on Africa, I've clearly said that we do not condone any land grab. Again, we believe that the law should be changed so that this can be prevented. Well, on that note, we'll have to end today's discussion. Thank you to all of my guests. Roger Helmer, a UKIP MEP and the party's spokesman on industry and energy. James Hartfield is the director of the think tank Audacity. Vivian Moses is a visiting professor of biotechnology at King's College London. Rachel Noble is from ActionAid. And on the phone from Brussels was Rob Veerhout from EPUR.